Welcome to the Moffitt Method Podcast, where longtime strength conditioning coach Tommy Moffitt explores everything from the art of coaching, improving performance, sports nutrition, and mental training. Now, welcome your host, Coach Tommy Moffitt. Welcome to the Moffitt Method Podcast, and I am your host, Tommy Moffitt. If you're listening for the first time, please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast and share it with your friends. For more information about the Moffitt Method Speed, Strength, and Conditioning Program, please visit our website, themoffittmethod.fit, or email us at info at themoffittmethod.fit. Today's episode is part one of a two-part series with our amazing guest, Coach Tim Karen, co-founder of Allegiant Gym, author, and former collegiate strength and conditioning coach. As an industry-leading strength and conditioning coach, Tim has trained elite athletes in many top college programs, always focusing on the science-based principles of performance training. Coach believes all aspects of the body must be considered in order to maximize human performance. With two master's degree, one in performance enhancement and injury prevention, and one in strength and conditioning, Coach Karen is dedicated to educating trainers and trainees in the science of human performance. Welcome to the podcast, Coach. How are we doing today? Oh, man, I am amazing. Quote double A, super fantastic. Can you ever tell you that? Can you ever tell you that line? I love that line. It's the funniest thing. Super fantastic. Yeah, speaking of double A, he's deep in the squat toga right now. So uh, I'm sure those legs are growing. My, My son actually squatted. He's own it this year so fired up for double a squat tober and this podcast i'm really excited about having you on here and i appreciate it uh, more than you'll ever imagine i'm fired up to be on man thank you for having me all right so let's get started so uh i kind of asked this question to um to everybody that's on here uh i always worded a little bit different but the goal is the same what led you to seek a career in strength and conditioning? So the short answer is I didn't want to become a math teacher. Uh, <laughs> got my math degree and it was one of those ones. And here's the thing I always think about now in hindsight. I was good at math in high school because I was probably good at remembering or I did my homework mm-hmm. and you give this like false bravado of like, oh, I know math. And then you get to college and yeah. get exposed and you get crushed for four years. You're like, it was really hard to get the degree. I can't do anything with this. It's not like I can go to MIT and get like a doctorate in math. So I was like, I'm gonna teach high school. And I started teaching high school and talk about like, you know, the the full circle moment of like, now you work in gen pop and you get all high school kids, but man, I hate high school kids. I hated them. Like it was the worst. It was the worst (laughs) experience. Like I just couldn't do it. And I remember, you know, I went to do student teaching at the high school I went to and I asked uh, one of my teachers that was a big inspiration for me and i'm like i just i don't know man like it just doesn't seem like that rewarding of a job and he was like so blunt he's like i wouldn't do this if i were you (laughs) i'm like wow you're like the motivation behind this he's like i would do anything but this i was like all right so i literally went on last that night and i went to the internet and uh is early 2000s and very beta websites and you're like scrolling around trying to find other majors before you get out of here and what's transferring over elective wise and exercise science came up and i was like well if anything i'll just learn how to write a better workout for myself because i was really passionate about weight training at that yeah. point anyway just for you know bodybuilding like just kicking around with it I really very little knowledge of the industry uh, i didn't even know it was like a a vocation from outside of personal training uh the the idea of college and this might seem ridiculous right but yeah you know i'm sure when you first started like wait you can just be in the weight room with like football yeah. teams and like yeah. holy crap like that seems really interesting so honestly like that was the the genesis was like i don't want to teach math and then you start looking at like oh i can get a degree and essentially learning how to work out and so that's what i went into and whether it was like the discipline you learn from math or just getting just absolutely throttled with 
way out of your depth and having to work so hard just to get a C, then getting into exercise science and something you're really interested in to begin with. Right. And you get anatomy, physiology, biomechanics, um, motor learning, all these courses that are hard. They're not easy, but you're just way more interested and maybe have a more of like an affinity to it. Or maybe I was just more mature and you're just like, I was good. I, I learned yeah. this stuff quickly. I felt like I was I was excited about it because I, I was getting a, a further ahead and understanding stuff and I was building upon stuff. And then you get to these moments of like, you do like a, a sit for a certification test, like CSES and you pass the first time you're like, okay, like maybe I'm good at this. And then you start doing your internships and that's when it starts really turning, like whether you have the stomach for it or not, which I'll talk about here in a second about with our book, but like, I think that's the real moment, right? Like, can you go yeah. down and intern for you? And, you know, you're like, here's what you got, sink or swim. And you go, okay, like, I'm going to find out what kind of stuff this guy's got. And I intern for AA, I intern for Ciano, and intern for Craig Fitzgerald. And, like, you know, these guys are not going to give it to you. And yeah. when you walk wow. out of that situation going, okay, they're not giving me anything. In fact, I mean, Fitz made it harder. Uh, you know, Siano is not going to give you any emotion whatsoever in double A is once he feels weakness, he's just going to eat you alive, right? Like double A feeds off your weakness and you survive it and you actually do well enough where all of them give you some sort of offer to work for him. And that to me is like, all right, I, I think I found the job. And I remember when I interned for double A at Old Miss, it was like my fourth one. So I did a velocity did Harvard, did Georgia tech. And then I did Old Miss. And my father was like, at what point do you sit there and say, this is a work out? <laughs> And he's like, maybe you should fall back on this math degree. And I was like, I'll just do another internship. He's like, doesn't seem logical. And I'm like, but you don't get it. I'm good at yeah, this. I think right. I am. You know, and there was like a moment when at the end of that summer with Ole Miss, Siano actually offered me a job at Georgia Tech. And Double A is like, you're going to do mat drills. And I'm not lying here. Like, you know, it was Ogeron's the head coach. And you obviously know Coach O. And like, yeah. it was very specific the way we're going to do mat drills. And it was, you know, set ready ready or rebel ready and then go 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 but you have 100 guys in front of you it is yeah. absolutely nerve-wracking right and you see yeah Olympic especially with coach o especially oh, with coach o yeah and this is old miss this is <laughs> sec football like you know these kids are gonna eat your lunch if you're not yeah. like at least confident right like yeah. so double a threw me in the mix and he's like oh you're gonna be working at georgia tech let's see if you got the stuff and it was that moment that you're like, all right, I think I can really do this. Like I really yeah. do. I, I felt like I held my own. Um, you know, everyone's giving me high fives afterwards. Like you did great. And then I, I drove to Georgia Tech and I became a strength coach, which was uh that cool. Awesome. So that moment of like knowing what I didn't want to do and then over yeah. time learning what I wanted to do was when I wanted to become a strength coach. All right. So how did you move from collegiate strength and conditioning? What was the motivation for you to then jump into the private sector? So I can tell you the story. Um, just when the moment I knew, I was like, definitely yeah. need to figure this out. Uh, so a couple moments that led up to it. I was with Siano when Coach Gailey got fired and Paul Johnson came in. So those are your first test of like first year yeah. of the job, staff you're working for, getting, you know, Siano, the ultimate warrior, uh, <laughs> going through the, yeah. we got to prove ourselves, we got to keep our jobs, getting that and like not having yeah. a really good perspective on it. Then with double A at USC and, uh, end up part of the staff who gets fired and then Ogeron comes in and then obviously seeing the politics of like, that's, that was an interesting case study. And then yeah. ended up fortunate enough to get a head strength coach job at army. But I think every step of the way, you probably get a little bit more, like I have a lot less, a lot more sunk costs and a lot more, a lot, lo lot more to lose here. So yeah. every year you're thinking about like, I'm making six figures. I have a head strength coach job. There's only like 135 of us in the world. Like I got a lot to lose now. So you're always feeling this pressure, right? And you know, like I had really good staff and I'd always tell them that if I'm as good as I think I am, you will never take my job. It doesn't change the fact that they're really good and they've gone on to do really right. things. And you get these like kind of loaded things of like, oh, such and such is good. Maybe he should be the head strength coach. And you're like, where do I stand? You know, yeah. what, what really do I have in terms of actually job security here? And there was a moment going into the last last week uh, playing Navy. We had three weeks to prepare. And Navy was actually in the conference championship game going against Temple. So we had a really big unfair advantage. We track everything from GPS, wellness, RPE, get workloads, the whole nine. We had higher workloads than we did in preseason during the, during that week. And I remember our, my boss came up to me. He's like, guys look pretty lethargic. 
I'm going to ask you during the, the meeting, I want you to say we should back off. And we had really three things we could back off. One of the things that we found that when we, when we wanted to lower the overall workloads is either reduce periods or reduce actual the, um, the equipment that you're wearing. So if we're going helmets or shells, it's just going to be a lot less intensity. You're not going to the ground. You're not having as much contact. Or we can adjust these like high intensity sprinting periods, like not having kickoff for two periods in a row. Yeah. or not going kickoff in a seven on seven, which guys are sprinting, right? These like little things that like we're trying to like game it so it didn't feel that hugely impactful or at least having a day where it's lower every once in a while so it'd be like a tuesday practice we've gone essentially at this point 10 days straight of full contact practice 24 yeah. periods every single time it's like we're not doing our, our team of service here the guys are beat up they're tired you know when you get to the point where you're doing certain periods and the guys are going over with you in muscle beach to pull out like it's yeah. not good it's not a great thing so you're like coaches like preposition me like hey i want you to go and tell the guys that we need to back off for practice and i was like Tim, what do you think? I was like, we need to cut back a period. Do we need to go shells and helmets? We need to give these guys a break. They're just beat up. Can we have a walkthrough period? Can we do something? And I just got chewed out by our defensive coordinator. I mean, he laid into me. I mean, he's like, you call me an idiot. He's like, I don't know oh, what talking about shouldn't be so he place to talk about. Oh, wow. Yeah, I was set up. I was not good. So it was that moment, and we decided to go full contact and full pads. It was that moment though of like, if we lose this game. Like all of us are at job risk, but like I knew exactly where I stood for the the long term future. Like eventually, I'm gonna have to go to that defensive coordinator. Like, hey, I'm really interested in this job. Can you put a good word for me or whatever? And I knew where I stood with the guy, right? And I know I didn't want to work for him. I know I didn't want anything from that guy. But eventually, I'll need him because it's all who you know. It's yeah. a network game. And I was like, I, I'm just done with this, man. Like I'm done with this like illogical, childish stuff of like the fact that I had a platform and I had enough enough rapport with the head coach that he's going to ask me in the middle of staff meeting, how many periods we should go and what we should go from shells, helmets or fulls. And like, I'm just going to get chewed out and then they're going to default to, well, the defense coordinator, offense coordinator want to go full and go 24 period practices. So you're out of luck. Like just doesn't seem. And then the part that was wild to me, coach was after that meeting where I got chewed out and everyone was just sitting there, get watching me get melted in front of everybody. All the assistants came up to me like, dude, you're hundred percent right. Like guys are dead. <laughs> yeah. They're falling asleep in meetings. They're, they're trying to pull out of practice. They're going to their training room. I'm like, and this is the biggest game of the year. It's a contract game. Like we have one huge advantage. We got three weeks of prep and rest where Navy was playing literally temple the week before. And I was like that moment, I was like, okay, what are my options here? If we don't beat Navy. I'm probably looking for a job. But the other part is like, if we do beat Navy and we didn't back off when I'm saying we should back off, I look like an idiot. So yeah. I started looking at options and I just so happened to got a, a call from a former athlete. He's like, we're looking to open up a gym and recreate that college experience. I was like, it's just funny you ask. Like I would definitely be interested if it's something that you would be considering of like taking on a partner and not on my radar at all. Like literally I can tell you going into October, no plans of ever leaving. And then November going into Navy and then realizing that <laughs> I don't really have a, a leg to stand on here if we were to lose yeah. or win. And then you get presented an opportunity. I'm like, and I wanted to take control of my own destiny, man. Like I right. wanted to be my own boss. I wanted to be someone that says, I choose whether I'm good or bad. And someone else doesn't make that subjective appraisal of me. And, you know, just to show you where it really stands. And I've told this now multiple times over, but when I told my boss I was leaving and I had no idea whether I was going to get fired or kept because we did follow the mantra of like one year, it was always going to be a sacrifice, good or bad. Yeah. It was like the Lou Holtz model. Like you're going to wake up on the last, the day after the last game and you're going to make a sacrifice to the football gods. And like, there's no real rhyme or reason. It's just, you are the next in the chopping block or enough people bitched about you where you're out. And I didn't know where I stood. I was like, I didn't know if I'm going to get fired, but I'm going to beat him to the punch. And he's like, damn, man, I actually got you a $50,000 raise, which is almost like, <laughs> you know, 40%. I was making 125. I was like, it's how little I knew where I stood. I didn't know if I was getting fired. Yeah, that's crazy. I yeah. Emotion. It was like, and you could kick yourself, and I haven't come near close to that money. But, you know, the other part of it was like, I, I did it on my terms, man. I reached a head strength yeah. coach position that I wanted to be at, which I set out from a guy with no experience, wanted to teach math, going into this now. I want to be a head strength coach. How many young strength coaches you say, like, I would love to be a head strength coach at a power five school yeah. or a division one program? It. Like, yeah. Yeah easier said than done and then going through the crucible getting fired multiple times and then reaching it like there's a certain level like I, I reached where i wanted to be 
And now I get to leave my own terms and I can control my own destiny and set my own schedule and do what I want, take on projects, write books, do stuff that I want to do without someone looking over my shoulder. So you think you're bringing enough attention to yourself? Like, I don't know. This is about, you know, such and such football program. It's not about you. Like, yeah, but you don't give me any job security. So why wouldn't I put a little time into it? And I think that narrative is changing, but definitely a little bit like don't bring too much attention to yourself at the time when we were in the like heavy in the industry. And hopefully now that narrative is changing because there's not enough job security to go ahead and say, you shouldn't at least have another option, alternate revenue stream, or at least a plan B. Yeah. And that, you know, that was one of my, um, the, the things that I didn't like about the five coaches rule. Um, and I've talked about it before on the podcast, because when there's only five coaches, it really makes it tough uh, for opportunities to open up. Well, that's for people who want to be a football strength coach. And I, yeah. and uh, that I, I mean, I love training other sports and all, but you know, if you're one of the five football strength coaches, you limit yourself for opportunities should you get fired or want to move around within the industry because there's only five of those positions available. And that makes it really tough for for people that are out searching for that because uh, there are some good places. I've worked with some coaches where I knew where I stood and there was clear lines of communication and we were able to, to sit down and hash these things out. And when a, when a guy serves you up on a platter like that and doesn't support you, that's tough, man. Yeah. Yeah. That's well, tough. And that's a, and we've all had that happen before, uh, um, which makes it tough, man. You're like, what am I doing? Um, well, to the point of your five strength coaches thing, like when I interned for all those guys, I was yeah. Like, the lowest guy in the totem pole. And I don't know if Seattle got this from you, but we used to do rack assignments. So you come in, you get to your rack yeah. and you have a coach sitting there watching you. And at Georgia tech, we had 12 racks and it went this like big U shape. I yeah. was on the last two racks and yeah. Seattle would be really come over. And then every single couple of weeks I start moving up by the end of that yeah. first summer, I was on racks five and six. And I'm yeah. like, Whoa, I got pretty good indication. I'm doing a good job here, but yeah. there was 10 guys in front of me. Like yeah. I was the 10th guy. Like it was like way yeah. down the totem pole yeah. and I could see where the top two racks were, which were directly across from me. And I'm like, this is where I stand. I would never yeah. have had that opportunity to be a strength coach in that level unless they could take on eight, nine, 10 people, yeah. uh, which yeah. I would have racks then, which is crazy to think about now. Yeah. Like that's gone. That's not a thing anymore. Yeah. It's definitely a profession where you're a lot like a starving artist and you have to do internships and you've got to move around because there just aren't enough positions available for you. Um, you know, you have to earn, you know, you have to earn the respect from someone and then be hopeful that they call you and offer you a job. And, and you were, so you mentioned some really good people. I mean, uh, Eric Craig and double a are, three of the finest men. And, you know, I haven't gotten Eric on here yet, but Craig and double a have been on here and Eric was going to do it. But just like Eric is, he got busy, Always you know, busy. and it was <laughs> over like that. Uh, but um, you were working for three really good guys. Just imagine, you know, the people that aren't working with someone that's not a great person. And you were within that group of people, you were assured an opportunity somewhere down the road because they appreciate the effort that you put into being a great strength coach. Uh, But there's other people I've had, I've had interns uh, come here where they worked for a coach where they had to ask for permission to talk to the head strength coach. And I I couldn't imagine having a team of young coaches where that was the case. Um, yeah. You know, anybody that ever worked for me, assistant coach, intern, volunteer, or someone just shadowing, the purpose for them being there was twofold. One, that they get the the experience they need to move on in our profession, and two, to help me coach our team. So we had an open-door policy. And I would tell them, you can come talk to me anytime. You can call me. You can come by the house and we can drink a beer. Um, 
But wow, man, that's unbelievable. Yeah. All right. So yeah, I mean, let me that's ask you. Part two. Go yeah. ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. No, no. What were you going to say? I, I think that's the part that's so hard for young strength coaches is the yeah. you're choosing these internships as much as they are choosing you. Yeah. And there's got to be at least some vetting process because you're going to contribute a lot of time and a lot of money. Yeah. And you're out of pocket to get there. You're out of pocket to live there. You're out of pocket for food and all the other things that go yeah. with it. And it at least should have a person that's going to have a mutual respect for you or, Hey, yeah. if you work hard, I will treat you right. Right. And it's, it's not a given. And it is what it is. Cause I think we, you've been on the other end of how many emails do you get in a day and a week and a month of like, man, I'd love to come work for it. And everyone's just kind of kicking tires. They're not really serious about it. Yeah. And you're like, I, I, same story. You know, just let, let me see how this plays out where you, you know, you can't give your time to every single person that asks for it, but when they start to earn it, you go, okay, like you're worth the time because you actually value it and you're actually going to pull something from it. But yeah. on the other note, like there's a lot of people that just don't necessarily even care. Like there's no outlet yeah. of like, oh, wow, I potentially might have a future employee one day, or man, when someone calls me and needs a good coach. I can help them out and send them there because it's just a better yeah. fit for them at that point. You're just building up this Rolodex of people. And it's it's a very, very cyclical thing. Like one day that yeah. person's going to call you and say, hey, I got a position. Or, man, maybe they give you a job one day. And it's like all because yeah. you just – it's it, the, the full circle moment here in strength <laughs> conditioning is always going to play yeah. itself out. But, man, I find so many young strength coaches have no inventory of how this is going to benefit them in their career. And a lot of experienced strength coaches are looking at this as, like, just a formality and something that you just kind of do to, like, check a box and no real interest in it, no real upside. I'm like, they're not here to clean. They're not here to set up and break down. It's part of it. But they're also potentially people that can bring value either in during that internship or potentially – having a, a position that you have available. And like, I always like that. Like, I don't need to go to CSCA. I don't know to get in. I don't need to go to NSCA. I have a huge roster of guys of intern for me that exactly. I can call up and I can go to them and say, do you have anybody that might be a good fit? If you're not, if you're not yeah. interested, like, it's just it's such great opportunity to yeah. build your, your staff, like yeah. organically. It's just, it's right there. Best example I can give you. Um, Ciano called me, I should say coach Eric or mm -hmm. Coach Ciano, but uh, I'm not going to call him by his nickname, but yeah, Eric. Yeah. <laughs> We're just allowed to be like that or not. He'll tell different things. That's so funny. When he's around you, he loves it. When he's around me, he's going to call him that. I told someone his nickname one time. And this is when he first got to the Bills. He called me up. He goes, I can't believe you told him <laughs> Well, there's UT Seattle and then there's everything else, man. Like, yeah. That's, that's part of life, you know? uh, yeah. So he, uh, coach calls me and says, Hey, um, I need to hire a female. And uh, do you have someone that you would recommend? And I had m met Melissa seal. Her name was Melissa Moore then. Mm -hmm. And I had met Melissa. She came over. The national conference was in New Orleans, and she drove up to Baton Rouge. She was from Slidell, so not a big trip. But she came over. We met, exchanged phone numbers. And then she went off to Southern Miss for to finish her master's degree. And uh, so I told Eric about Melissa. Uh, and so Eric hires Melissa at Georgia Tech. And then a um, few years go by, and um, – I'm in a position where I can hire uh, an associate director. Uh, so I called Eric and said, Eric, hey, uh, how's Melissa doing? Oh, coach, she's doing great. I love her. She's, you know, great coach, works hard. I said, well, I think I'm going to hire her. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> so we hired her and she came to work. She is still there. So she took over my position when I left. And she's been at LSU now, uh, shoot, it's got to be 20, 21 or 22 years. Yeah, when uh, we and, Georgia Tech, she was still there. Yeah. And so, so the neat the thing time. is, yeah, number one, her first impression uh, was really good with me. And because I just recommended her, I didn't have anyone else to recommend. And so obviously her first impression was really good. And my intuition was good. 
and she's the exact same person that Eric said she was. She's a hard worker. She's tough. She knows, you know, and she actually, so I had surgery in 2009 when I had, uh, when I was diagnosed with cancer and I could not go through the, our mat drills. And so that was my station was the mat drills. And so Melissa had worked her tail off for football and coaching. Uh, she was coaching women's basketball and softball at the time. And I asked her, I said, Melissa, would you mind, would you be interested in doing the fourth quarter drills in my station? And her eyes lit up like this. And she said, coach, I would love to, can I? And I said, absolutely. Yeah. And so she took over for the mat drills for me and I would stand there and watch her. And after, you know, a couple of groups, I was like, man, she's got this down. And then I could move to other stations, but I wasn't allowed to do any shouting or jerking movements, you know, because mm -hmm. I'd had surgery probably a couple, probably about a month before that. So the doctor said, you can't do anything. So she crushed it. And then we ended up hiring, and you probably don't know Christina Hall, yeah. but yeah. you know Christina. She played did, softball. Yeah. yeah. So Melissa recommended Jackson, Christina. Yeah. Yes. And yes, Christina Jackson. So she came here, was a graduate assistant, helped Melissa, and then worked some with us with football, met Paul, and her and Paul got married. So I always tell that story. So that is the probably the proudest uh thing I am about my time here, one of the proudest things is that we had coaches who met their spouses while they were both employees here. So Paul's one, Brian Johnson is another. So it was really cool to have coaches come here and meet uh, their spouse that they're married to today. So you, you super cool. Tenure to be able to accomplish that. You know, you yeah. Know, yeah. About, you know. <laughs> now the thing that I've always asked, you know, and this is, um, you know, I never had a player or a former coach name a child after me. So that kind of pisses me off. Well, yeah, you know, I thought they'd show a little bit more respect after all I did for yeah, them. But yeah, I mean, we'll do time. I guess you can't have everything. Yeah. Just maybe a grandson or something. Oh, yeah, you never yeah. know. Yeah. And don't give up on that, man. <laughs> yeah. Good time. Good time. All right. So what's the story behind the name Allegiant? Where did that come from? I know. So I actually Googled the word. So it, it's, I guess, and you may correct me, it has, it's short for allegiance or it has something to do with allegiance or Ooh. not. Uh, recreating a college experience for everybody. That was the original thought is, hey, I had a really good weightlifting experience and college transitioning experience and then get out and there's no good options right there's yeah. fox gym there's other boutique stuff there's just nothing like close yeah. to the experience we had so we started talking about like words like collegiate elite uh we started doing oh like, so i wasn't even close well so the point of that though it is latin for he has chosen which definitely yeah. like Health, yeah. but the word is just kind of a made up word based off of oh, wow. and collegiate. Uh, and this is a, my business partner was a former athlete at USC walk yeah. on like tough as nails, like brilliant, smart, creative. We had our physical space. We didn't have a name. So it was just a empty room. I uh, closed all the doors and he walked in there and screamed allegiance to the top of his lungs. And he's like, it just had this power and reverberation. Okay, cool. And like, yeah. and uh, he's like, we're all like, all right, that's, that's a good litmus. I feel like that's a great name. Then. And if yeah. you scream in a random room test and yeah, uh, which yeah. It, it definitely like took form there. And then, yeah. You know, the, um, I think at the time we we're all kind of collectively reading shoe dog. And, you know, when Phil Knight's talking about pronouncing Nike and like, everyone's like, what does that even mean? Like that, like that feeling of if we can prove this word and make it part of everyone's vernacular and make it comfortable right. saying like, it's still like, uh, Alligate or like, yeah. um, yeah. you know, is it a Legion airlines base? Like, what are you guys a yeah. gym for a Legion? Like, or like <laughs> that, like Legions, or it's funny to watch people's pronunciation of it. And it's, and it's like, okay, it's a great reminder of like, you're not a household name and you still yeah. got a long, a lot longer to go. Oh. But the fight now is like 
making it as recognizable and, and easily understood like his Nike, right? Like Allegiant, 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 just getting that point yeah. where it's like, oh yeah, I know what that is. It's high quality strength training, whatever that association yeah. with it is. Cool. Awesome. All right. So moving forward, can you, and, and I think I have a pretty good idea because we've been friends for a long time and I've read all your stuff and watched your podcast, but for the audience, can you describe your coaching philosophy? And I know this, this could go on and on and on, but yeah. how would you describe well, your philosophy? Well, this is a pretty good, I think, entry point to what's your elevator pitch for your business or you like, why should I buy mm -hmm. you kind of thing? And we were talking about offline of a, hey, like we're selling something to anybody, whether I'm right. working in the college sector or the, and one of the things college strength coaches or team sector coaches don't realize is you're really good at sales. You just don't know it yet right. is, can you say something that's so easily understood that they ask more questions? And my philosophy is do whatever I need to do from a movement and volume intensity and duration standpoint that get the job done. And that could be compound multi-joint movements. That could be Olympic lifts. That could be sprint testing. That could be stationary cardiovascular equipment. What is your goals? What are the constraints? And then let's find the best solution based off of that. And a lot of times it's the environment. Like I don't have all a prone leg curl. So how am I going to develop hamstrings when this person's coming off an ACL? Hey, I don't have a stationary piece of cardiovascular equipment, but this person wants to lose 30 pounds. Or, hey, this person's never touched a barbell before and they want to put on 30 pounds of muscle. Like th these things are always presented to us yeah. and we have our preconceived solutions or whatever. I don't want to lock in and marry to any single one of them. Uh, and, you know, I'm proud enough to say that I've been really curious and like, all right, I'm going to go learn LSU's weightlifting progression, whether it's directly from you or as we all do in strength conditioning, pirating from someone else. Like I get secondhand all of Coach Moffitt's programs or his, his teaching progressions. And then I get that next level of like, well, if I don't have uh, the good equipment or the space to do weightlifting, what would I do to develop power? Like, okay, well, let's dive into like West side or whatever else that's going to do something with a little different emphasis or, Hey, bodybuilding's out there and I'm going to dive into that. And I'm going to read all the hit journals and I'm going to go through all these different things and try to pull from it. So if I'm ever in the weird precarious situation where I don't have a single piece of equipment and, uh, and I can tell you this and another great female strength and conditioning story. Like I was, I remember seeing double a, we did furlough days at Georgia tech. My, after the housing collapse in 2008, and I was like the lowest guy in the totem pole. And Tiana was like, so like, he was like, I don't know how to say this, but you can't come into work tomorrow. You have to literally not take pay for a day. I never knew what furlough meant to that point. So I was yeah. like, well, let me call double a, it was at UT under uh, Kiffin at that point. Yeah. And I was like, I drove up to UT and I'm like, I'm working with women's basketball. I'd really like to meet Heather Mason who comes from like a Mickey Marotti high intensity mm -hmm. training background. And I read at this point, all of Mike Mentor stuff, all of Arthur Jones's yeah. stuff. And you can yeah. easily like, I'm following this like pet this tree from like yeah. you, Johnny Long, Eric Ciano, Aaron Osmus, like, okay, it's, it's like Gail Hatch type of thing. And like, you can get typecast of like, well, you don't care about hit. You're just going to be poo poo in this stuff. I'm like, I've read everything. I've read it all. Yeah. Like, you know, all the Ellington Darden stuff. And like, yeah. I mean, it was just that connection of like, I am so willing to go out there and learn about this stuff. And I, I, I'll tell you this, you want to find someone who's coaching hard and making a big impact on their athletes, watch a really classically trained high intensity training coach. And yeah. I could tell you philosophy wise, probably a disagreement dis disagreement on certain things, yeah. but you watch them connect to their athletes during something like a manual resistance yeah. lateral race. And I saw Heather like this moment of like, I've never seen anyone coach like this, but this girl yeah. just gave in, right? She was doing a lateral raise and Heather's doing manual resistance on her. She's like, now I know you got a lot more in you. You're not, you're quitting to me way too early. And it was so deadpan and so serious. And that right. girl was like, like shook into her core. And I saw her grind out and extra three reps. And like, I feel like I'm in that moment. I'm like, damn, could I do that yeah. with the Georgia tech football guy? Could I do that? Like, could I get this person to push three reps past or whatever it is they're accustomed to doing to the point of like the original question of like, what's my philosophy? Like, you know, being willing to learn, but understanding like, all right, man, like there's a job to do. I'm not going to limit myself to tools or certain things that I believe is just artificially true. Mm -hmm. I'm going to expose myself to as many solutions as possible and try to find that best thing for that situation. And my environment will shape that, right? I have a gym with yeah. six racks, dumbbells, barbells, and kettlebells. So if you're telling me like, Hey, I got a torn ACL 
and I got to do something else besides like heavy loaded back squats. Like I'm pretty strict limited, right? So I got to find solutions yeah. outside of that. Or, hey, I want to lose 30 pounds and I can't really do a whole lot of the movements you're prescribing, like whether it's Olympic lifts or squatting, hinging, right. doing pull-ups, stuff like that. Like, what are my options here? Can I do a body weight workout? Can I buy a stationary piece of equipment? You know, these stuff always presents itself. So to answer your question, just very directly, it's find what the outcome is and understand the environment constraints and do what works. Like just get yeah. to that in the most linear path possible. Yeah. Wow, man. That was, uh, that was well done. And, you know, when you talk about high intensity training, I think especially people in my age group, some of our older coaches, like young coaches, if you say high intensity training, they, they think you might be talking about int interval training, you know, yeah. and doing you know, stuff for your cardiovascular system. But uh, when you mentioned Mike Metzer, I know, you know, double A's uh, uh, love for that man and his, and double A did high intensity training during the off season uh, when he was uh, training with us at Tennessee. Yeah. And so everyone that grew up, uh, in the seventies, like myself in the eighties knows of high intensity training. And at one time there was actual battles between those two philosophies, uh, and coaches who, uh, practiced one or the other. And that was, you know, that was 20 years ago, uh, yeah, where you'd you, go to conferences. Yeah, Boyer Co. Boyer Co. was from yeah. there, right? Yeah. And he's from, like, yeah, Boyer. Argument. And yeah, Casey Vieira, yeah. was he in Louisiana as well? Yes. And so everyone yeah. here knew who Borja Co. was. In yeah. fact, Bo he uh, was one of the founders of the company uh, Body Masters, which mm -hmm. if you've ever trained on any equipment, uh, you know, selectorized equipment, there was not a better piece of selectorized equipment uh in the time that was built better than body masters equipment. And Borea Co was one of the founding, uh, uh, businessmen who started that company, but you had rap time, right? Yes. We, so yeah. when we redid our weight room here at LSU, the first time, um, I was, uh, I because I'm in, that's the generation. That's where I came from. That was my roots. Um, and so, and the fact that I got to go hang out in the facility there, their manufacturing facility, me and Will Jones, who was an assistant here, Will and I would drive down there and uh, watch them build our stuff. And they had all the jigs and they walked me through, uh, through their warehouse. And Will and I got to see the entire manufacturing process, but a jig for the people that uh, that don't know the manufacturing of steel, you had a plate laid out and then you would lay the pieces of metal after they'd been cut and you fastened them to a jig so that when you welded them, they were going to be perfectly square and, you know, they would stand up right and the frame wouldn't be crooked. So they went and showed me all their jigs and all the stuff that they used to build the equipment. So that was a great experience to be a part of that. And then, um, at one time they were the biggest, um, uh, equipment company. They were where Sornex is today at one time, they were the biggest, uh, seller in the world. And then when life fitness and hammer strength joined, um, they took over because they were able to sell the equipment and the cardio that gave yeah. them power and uh, body masters, you know, they went through a couple of negotiations and stuff with uh, uh, Fit, I think was the name of the cardiovascular equipment and all, but that's when hammer uh, cornered the market and that's, they just grew exponentially after that. Yeah. And then a company. So what body masters did is they bought a, a laser cutter and a bender and they were really coming out with some nice stuff. And, um, but the laser that they use, and that was where you cut the numbers out on the racks and you do a lot of custom stuff with the lasers. It cost them so much that they were had a side business in the shipping industry. And they were at night 
on the second shift, they would do stuff for the shipping industry to help pay for the upgrades that they were making in their facility. And then somebody came and bought the company and told them that we're going to keep the body masters line going and et cetera. But they bought the company, they got the laser for a good price. And then they just shuttered the, the equipment company and closed it down. So quick, yeah. uh, quick digression on the history of it, but yes. Yeah, so, um, um, high intensity training and, and, you know, there are still benefits to hit training today. Mm -hmm. uh, we know through practice and research and all the data and technologies that we have that training for power and strength with barbells and kettlebells and dumbbells is better. It's more efficient. Uh, you, you have a longer developmental period, you know, you can reach higher results in the end, but there is still great benefits to, to high intensity training that a lot of people don't even know about today. Uh, uh, intent alone, right? Whereas some yeah. of the kids get to yeah. those hard reps or those hard sets right. and I mean, exactly. find what they're made of. But like, I think you create a higher level of tolerance with every yeah. single exactly. that you go to true failure in a safe way. Right. If I'm going to failure yeah. on leg extension, that's different than going to failure in squats. But you understand what real failure feels like and what fatigue right. feels like. And like you got more reps in you. And I think you need to expose yourself to that in a very safe and very controlled environment yeah. with someone that understands like the right. the risk reward here. And then you parlay that. And that's I mean, double A would talk about that. He's like, when you get to these really hard squat cycles that you're doing, he's like, I felt like I was the one who understood what real failure was. Yeah. And I kept getting stronger because when it got to those really big points of like maximal training and getting an extra rep that most people are like, I can't do that. Like I would do it. And that's why I became a national champion. And like right. I, I, that sits with you like a lot. And like, there's, there's a lot of intersection there. And I find yeah. so many young football athletes who weren't exposed to strength conditioning can benefit a lot from just understanding, like, here's the expectation, give everything you got with great technique and you're going to be just fine. But yeah. understanding the technique aspect is probably most important for safety, but everything you yeah. got is the hardest thing to translate. Like there's so many right. people who coaches and athletes who don't really understand what that really actually is in a yeah. safe way. And, you know, when you're training heavy and for strength, um, I've seen people um, drop the bar at 0.4 meters per second. And you're, you're like, you just, <laughs> you just so did. More. Yeah, you got so much more in you. And I think by training that way, you teach yourself that you can grind out reps, safe reps at 0.17 meters per second or 0.14 meters per second because you've you've taught yourself to be able to do that. And some sports require that type of strength. And um, the only, you're not going to develop that stopping at 0.4 meters per second well and you know what helped me a lot with that tommy was to decide when i was at army and i remember our first like meeting our my boss head coach was like you got two minutes to get over the indoor which is like a five minute walk <laughs> and everyone <laughs> and then everyone was late right like everyone was late they left their cleats in the locker room the whole thing right and it was just like everyone's you could hear them they're all bitching like <laughs> this is fucking impossible no one's gonna be able to make it and i'm like all right let's start doing some up downs and I'm like you know yeah. the problem is you quit before you even start it yeah. You didn't even try. Yeah. You, like it's right. it ridiculous. It was everyone knows yeah. it was wrong, but you just went at it with the wrong attitude. And from there, I'm like, I talked to my staff, I was like, oh, we're gonna give them a heavy dose of hard work. I mean, we're just gonna yeah. tell them they've got to raise their level. So we're doing there, there's a couple like big like Friday things that we do. Like one was like a Mike Gittleson 50 rep leg press, uh, the yeah. old Michigan strength coach. And I'm like, I want to see what their stuff is. And then the other one yeah. was 200 kettlebell swings unbroken. And yeah. I'm not going to sit here and say that was the, the edge that we got and why we eventually beat yeah. Navy. But I'll tell you this year one, man, guys could even do 245s on the leg press for 50 reps. Like they were doing 10, yeah. stopping, walking around. Like these are ridiculous. These are army guys. Yeah. And then they couldn't swing the 20 kilo kettlebell more than like 20 times without having to put it down. By year three, there was a big sign of like, hey, I'm going to take all of our freshmen. They're going to do three plates. We're going to wrap it out for 50 reps, unbroken. And then the kettlebell swings, like we had so many guys swinging the 40, the 44, the 48, 200 reps without stopping. I'm like, yeah, that's that's pretty damn impressive. Yeah. And 
and we didn't do kettlebell swings or leg press. We just did it as yeah. an adjunct to go, right. don't forget hard work always trumps talent. Right. Like, don't forget That's that. Right. That's our edge. And like that mentality of like these impossible things, like here's something that you won't be able to do. I just want to see what your response to that is and see how yeah. you react. And if you go at it, like I'm going to give it my best effort. I'm going to try my absolute hardest. We got a chance. If you're already going out and saying, I'm a fail, I already, this is impossible. What's I, can't I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. Like, yeah. just try. And I'm never going to put you in a position where you're going to get hurt or do something that's not in your right. best interest. All yeah, right, we're trust not me on that. And it takes a little bit of time to develop that. But when you get to that 200 better kettlebell swing, like, you get that one random question, like, can I swing the 48? <laughs> that's going to be a tough Friday yeah. afternoon for you. But I'll, yeah, why not? And then yeah. you do it. I'm like, hey, I just yeah. went 200 unbroken. Like, you did what? Like, really? Like, yes. Like, 48 kilo kettlebell, 200 unbroken? Like, wow. Yeah. Like in year one, like ripped up hands, calluses flying, like, like just all of a sudden the next Monday you see this like gauze all around their hands. Like I can't hold the bar coach, like all this <laughs> stuff. Like and now it's like they're whatever. This was a physical manifestation of just hard work or yeah. this was actual like the product of like, we're going to set the bar so high and you're going to yeah. rise to that level. And that was the edge. And that, you get that from hit. You get that from like different, different philosophies and that's yeah. my point of like if you marry yourself to one thing if you're a one trick pony you're going to be limited to that scope and what the upper limit is like if i was going to say like yeah. all right man like weightlifting is this and if you're not lifting matt bruce level numbers you're not a good lifter like that's not true like i've seen plenty right. of guys get great results snatching 40 kilos and just focusing on bars yeah. and like that's good exactly you know and like all yeah. right let's move on let's get to squats let's do this like just give yeah. your best effort yeah, uh, so many things are racing through my mind right now because, um, you know, in, at at a place like LSU or Ole Miss or or Georgia Tech or Army, it doesn't matter what level of sport, and it doesn't matter if it's football, wrestling, or basketball, or tennis, uh, or golf. Uh, putting to win a championship. Uh, it's got to be as stressful as lining up on fourth down and. <laughs> Unless you're, you know, you could be playing uh, Happy Gilmore too, but nobody's going to come spear you in the throat, you know, right as you let the ball go. But um, if you walk around in life saying, I can't do that, I can't do that, that's too hard, I would never be able to do that, you're never going to accomplish anything of any significance, I don't feel, in life. And life is challenging, uh, you know, um, and – People often, well, Pat Summit, the great University of Tennessee basketball coach, said our world is full of average people um, that do average things. And so I've and you, we've all seen athletes that give up mentally f way before they're ever physically challenged. And those guys seldom, if ever, achieve the level of success that they should in athletics because they can't overcome a little bit of adversity, whether it's mental, physical, or emotional, they just shut down and they look to take the easy way out. And that is something that goes beyond sets and reps. Mm -hmm. And uh, the weight room to me was always an extension to the practice field. And uh, it was part of my responsibility to prepare those guys for that. And that now unbroken, is that Louis Zamperini? Is that a, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. is that yeah. all right? USC, See, I love right. that, yeah. man. Yeah. yeah, I love that. Um, so uh, I could go on and on. This is going to be a good podcast because uh, of your racks and the phrases that you have over like Shackleton. You have the yeah. Shackleton rack. Do you have an unbroken rack? No, or Zamperini no. rack. Yeah. Um, I was at USC when he spoke there. Yeah. Um, definitely not politically correct. Um, yeah. Interesting. They made a movie about him. Definitely not one you want to go, oh, yeah, I'm going to name of do anything Oof. with my business based off of that. Like, it was like, oh, this is bad. I hope no one's yeah. filming this right now. <laughs> like, yeah. He's harbored a lot yeah. of grudge since he was in, a, uh, what do they call it, a determined camp oh. in uh, World War yeah. II. Like, he's definitely not the uh, the most politically correct guy in the world. Uh, that was the joke we were naming the racks. Like, we're not doing Zamparini. I know that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not getting yeah, burned but, uh, that down the road. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, so yeah, there's so much that goes on in athletics, uh, whether you're on the court or a pitch or a field Mm -hmm. or a mat that again, goes beyond sets and reps and you've got to find a way to develop that. And I used to tell our players all the time that the brain is the strongest muscle in your body. And then I had a player tell me one time, says, coach, (laughs) you, you made me, you made me fell a test coach. I I put, (laughs) you know, I was like, come on, man, you, you're not serious. He goes, yeah, coach, I I missed that question on a test. I was like, I'm there, man, I'm sorry. But really, (laughs) That is something that I think sometimes we take for granted that the young men and young women that we train understand, you know, the the amount of work and the adversity that you face, not only in athletics, but in life. And that's cool that you have a gym where people want that, you know, they want that college experience and be trained like a collegiate athlete. And that is really, really cool. Thank you. Really cool. All right, so um, we could go on for days. Uh, you just tell me how much time you have, okay? So I, I, we're going long form content today, man. Okay, okay, good, good, Clear good. The calendar here. All right, good. All right, so uh, and I'm sure a lot of our guests know who you are. They've listened to your podcast. They read your first book, Strength Deficit. Um. And they, like myself, know how deeply entrenched your coaching style is and your your program uh, in the available technologies, uh, and you often quote them. Can you speak briefly on what technology y'all use at uh, Allegiant and why? So I, I want to open up with, I hope everyone who's listening to this realizes that you can be really good without hardware or like really high level things like perfect coaching good coaching is good coaching right like that's the part that when i wrote the book i'm like thinking in my head i'm like imagine if i'm at a division three school or high school and i'm like just getting bombarded with you don't have a force play you're yeah you're not gonna win like that's not true exactly that's absolutely not true like it's still gonna come down to who's gonna work the hardest and who's gonna be have the best program uh but with that being said is to the point of my philosophy do what works there's a certain openness that if I'm just doing anything, I'm not really held accountable to anything. And I think that part for me is something I need to really be conscientious of. So when I'm looking at tech, I want to have one non-human influence things that objectively evaluate what I'm doing. Right. And I think you've seen enough jumps with the vertex to go, this person's been coached up how to retract their shoulder and bend their knees. They're game in this or you know, that pro agility or the kids leaning in that direction, like just get a good time, man, just run hard. You know, those things of like, I always wanted tools that just remove the, the the hacking or the cheating. Right. And force plates have that been that. And we use force deck from vault, uh, which is a bilateral, it's a, a bilateral plate, meaning it could go right, left. So I can see a couple things. And what this does for me, first off, hey, Tommy, I don't know you. Great to meet you. Do you have any pain, injuries, or surgery you should know about? And what I'm going to have you do is jump on this plate. Do you feel comfortable jumping? I get a lot of information right there without yeah. ever meeting you, right? So this is the game in private strength conditioning. It's I got to convince to you that my product is better than someone else's and you have complete autonomy and when you go and where you go, it's your money, it's your time. I have to convince you that, hey, this is going to be a great training experience. And if it's a battery of tests without actually any physical training, you're probably going to go not into it. I got yeah. throttled this other place. So I have to battle this. I got to have something that can find really tangible, good information with a lot of different coaches with a range of experiences. We'll have coaches in their first year, coaches like myself in their 20th year. And we have to be able to make a very conscious, objective decision for what is the best vector from this person, from what we shouldn't do, from contraindicated exercises, as well as what we should do from a training standpoint, what's the upper volume, frequency, intensity that we can use. Where force plates is not the holistic answer, but it's one that myself and everyone on our staff can use as a tool to have a common ground for what's good. So if we find that you have pain or injuries, that's the best predictor of future injury. So just having that simple question is a really good first step. Then asking them, do you feel comfortable jumping? And if they say no, it probably means that they're not going to be great with a barbell. And I'm not, it could be speculative at best, but if they're very apprehensive and timid about jumping, 
that what am I going to do with a barbell with them? Right. They're probably in pain. They're probably really intimidated by this or have no experience with anything like this. They're gung ho and they have no injuries, pain or surgeries. I just opened up Pandora's box a little bit more. And then we go through this next level of, can we see if they have any asymmetries when they jump and land? If they're shifting the weight right to left at a greater than 15%, there's information coming out, maybe 10% is more of a cutoff. But point being is if they have 15% or more, probably means there's something going to go on when they're squatting or hinging or RDLing or swinging, right? So they're just going to, like I always tell someone, you got a flat tire going on the 405 if we see, a, see this. Eventually, something's not going to be good for your car. Same thing when we're doing enough squatting. And that's the part that when we transition to the private sector, it's Groundhog's Day. It's not the same as the team setting. Yeah. It's 52 weeks a year, three times a week, and hoping you keep them in for as long as possible. Our lifetime value of the customer, we're trying to get at least six months, upwards to five years if possible, and longer. Right. So yeah. it's it's 50 weeks, three times a week, for six, five, six to 10 years. Like that's a lot of squatting, hinging and, and yeah. lunging and all this stuff we're doing. And if we open up with they have asymmetry or pain and we're just pounding them with this stuff every week without any like athletic trainer saying that's kind of dumb or there's no reprieve going into preseason. We're going to back off or do anything. It's just constantly beating the crap out of them, having that first touch point. So that was that first part. But then it goes into this next level of what I'm doing is good. It should manifest in jumping higher, right? Like that's, that is the, the true north of a good versus bad strength conditioning program, right? Are we jumping higher? Meaning, can we create force better? Can we utilize the eccentric force better? Can we balance ourselves out to get much vertical displacement as possible? We can look at that through jump height, very simple, or time off the plate. We can look at reactive strength index, which is not a proprietary thing. It's a very known metric. So it's on four stack, <laughs> ball, uh, four stack. Sparta, as well as Hawkins, any of these force plates utilize RSI might be a slightly different number depending on how they uh, interpret that. But it's all the same thing. We're, how much time we spend on the plate versus time in the air determines your RSI or reactive strength index. And it basically tells you how well you utilize eccentric force as well, right? If I have a very short time on the plate and long time in the air, pretty elastic, uh, which if you read strength deficit, is a pretty central theme to people who play outside the box. I want to see really high RSIs. I want to get really high because that means I can create a really good counter movement and react to that and drive up off, off the mat. Then we go into this next level of impulse, which is more force respective of time. So if I'm spending more time on the plate and I produce more force, I'm going to have a higher impulse doesn't sound like an offensive lineman to me like it does like if i could produce a lot of force regardless of time well, it's just basically this road grader okay well that's the other end of the strength deficit continuum it goes into this concept of inside versus outside we have elastic or eccentric and we have concentric or folks that want to overcome inertia and that's the that's the framework but when i look at from gen pop i can look at those if, okay i'm getting stronger and i'm getting more elastic or i'm getting more efficient I'm basically just becoming better over time. And the things that I'm doing from squatting, hinging, pushing and pulling, doing 10 by 10 or doing a five by five or whatever the set rep scheme tempo that I'm doing is manifesting to jumping higher with less, with less asymmetry. It's net positive. So those are really good touch points there. What we found though, is that's a, a part of the puzzle, a small piece of it, where we get a lot of handful of folks, like and we see this in athletics all the time of this just lackadaisical approach. Like, I don't get why I'm doing this. So I'm just going to basically give a half-ass effort. Where we found is the best way to substantiate that information. And so what we're now seeing with the research of if we find asymmetry, we need to support that with something else that's asymmetrical. And we could we do functional movement screen on folks, but there is a level of subjectiveness to it. Not much, mm -hmm. but there is. And we look at Nord board, which is the Nordic eccentric hamstring test from Vault as well, that there's no way to cheat that. And on top of it, if we find asymmetries between those two, two metrics or something significant, so now we have a cooperating metric that we can find that, as well as the other part, is I can do everything in front really well with free rate, free weight movements. I can bench, I can squat, I can lunge, I can do everything in front. It becomes harder and harder with the stuff in the back, right? Especially yeah. with John Pop. So if I have to yeah. do pull-ups and I can't do a single pull-up, what's my progression? I can get you down to inverted rows, maybe dumbbell rows. Is that going to be enough to be able to get you eventually doing a pull-up? Hard to say. If I'm at 10% of what I potentially can do from a pull-up perspective, that's a lot to overcome. Yeah. And it's a lot to say if I'm doing a good or bad job, right? If I make a 2% improvement, it feels like nothing. Like I can't even pull my body an inch up <laughs> towards the bar. So how do I 
objectively evaluate my program. The other part though, is we're going to hinge just as much as we squat. So whatever we squat, yeah. we're going to probably do an RDL. That doesn't necessarily create hamstring strength the way we think it does. And we found that through our Nordic eccentric curls, right? So if we do someone who can RDL, like the rainbow, like 352, can they do a full Nordic? Not 100%. Right. And you think that's a lot of posterior chain strength. Yeah. But when you ask them to do a full Nordic without touching their hands to the ground, it's not really necessarily a given. So what do we find? We have to test that is just as much as we're testing jump height to support what we're doing, because it's easier to do what's in front and hold myself accountable to make sure that we have structural balance and accountability with what we're doing. So we'll test Nord board as well. And the final one, which is really big now, I'm um, talking about with like Peter Atia and Outlive, but grip strength. Right. If yeah. I'm working with Gen Pop and getting into the 40s and 50s, that reduced grip strength is a significant indicator of all cause mortality. That I, this is an early mm -hmm. indicator of potentially risk for cardiovascular disease, metabolic disease, some sort of orthopedic issue. You know, there's going to be some stuff going on. And if I start to see asymmetry, which I think this is such a Peter Tia just posted the um, research article of it, like people with sarcopenia show a massive asymmetry, like not a like diagnosis right but i see asymmetries all the time and then you start asking some questions like oh i played baseball in college of course they're gonna yeah. have asymmetries of course they are like it's gonna be a hundred percent a given yeah. so we have to now find out okay like well what does that information really mean is it diagnosis is it putting up a big risk factor you know i've done enough stuff with charles Poliquin to realize like it's the best sales strategy like oh my god that's the worst i've ever seen and they go well how do i fix it like we trade with me that's the easy answer. Like you have to trade with oh, me. If you don't yeah. trade with me, that's gonna go you're just unchecked and eventually you're gonna <laughs> die. Yeah, it's just hysterical. Um, I find that just I, I find myself fighting this like over embellishing these metrics, but also too knowing that there's a significance to it and there's a, yeah. an impact from that. But also too, like getting to like I just got I got readiness right there. Like I got I, you don't want to invest in an aura whoop. I can see if this is down 10%, you're probably not going to put up your best effort squatting or hinging wise that day. Right. And that's, that's readiness. That's looking at the impact and the residual fatigue from having a couple of drinks on Friday night. That's yeah. the residual fatigue from having a uh, under two year old and not sleeping a whole lot. That's a residual fatigue from training really hard when you're 40 years old. Yeah. And if I see that slowly declining, when we've been trying to stabilize that over a long period of time, it's either I got to do three things. And this is really important for everybody to know in terms of diminishing returns. When I have a situation where people are paying to train, I got to find a way to keep them coming in three times a week. So I'm one, I can't get them hurt, but two, I got to adjust or toggle volume or intensity or duration or rest in order to accommodate them having a great session. And you're always going to get eventually meeting something where progressive overloads hits this apex and you can't yeah. do anymore. So you got to find a strategy. And we tell everyone when we start to see declines in jump height and Nordic strength and grip strength, we really can do three things. One, we can adjust the intensity. That's the easiest. Right. Just tell them to go lighter. No one even knows what they did last week anyway. Just tell them to go a little bit lighter. Progressive overloads off the cards today. And sometimes they're like, you don't know my spirit and what I can do. And they rise and overcome yeah. like, oh, my God, you proved me wrong. Yeah. I'm such an idiot. Wow. Look at you, man. So happy. I Not reverse psychology, but you did more than yeah. you should. The other part is you can start to adjust certain rest periods. Right. I can go, hey, you're going to go a little bit longer. Instead of 90 seconds break in between A1, A2, you're going to go 120 which is going to adjust their volume because we're still working within an hour. And the yeah. final part, which is a lot harder, is just dropping volume, right? You know, that stud, yeah. that person that's elite to a whole nother level. And you go up to him like, you're good. You know when to do it. You know when to do that intangibly. Like you just have this sixth sense of like, this is risk reward. This is not necessarily going to get us much more. This person's a first round draft pick every day. So if he's going to jerk 352 versus 330, I'm good on 330 where you yeah. have to figure that out with Gen Pop who aren't doing these incredibly like high level elite numbers. That could be a 60 kilo bench. Like yeah. that could be that something for them. And you got to go, okay, look, they don't have it today. So I need to cut them off. And I need to say, you're just going to do this instead. You're going to foam roll. You're going to do some extra core work. You do this on top of this, or maybe you just say like, the last two sets just go a little bit lighter so you're not missing out what everyone else is doing. And in terms of my world and Gen Pop, what I did was react to their readiness or lack thereof and found a solution that doesn't alienate them or 
ostracize them from the group as well as them feel like they got the value on that given day so they can keep fighting the good fight and making progress over time. So those are the big three. We use velocity-based training. We have gym aware, uh, which I really like. It holds me to a higher standard. And I've been mm -hmm. open on, I don't love velocity-based training for Olympic lifts because I think it's the, sh the shortest distance between two points right. is a straight line and it deteriorates a natural S-curve. And I've been overly biased off of like hardcore BBT folks of like, it's just a straight line up where Travis Mash and some other really yeah. smart coaches have found a way to like, no, this is it. So you're just talking about Matt Bruce and a second pull. You see that, right? Which yeah. is great and it's good. And I've now come full circle on that. But in terms of Gen Pop, it's the ultimate backup coach, right? It's, yeah. I didn't tell you that's too heavy. Coach Jim Aware did, or any VBT, yeah. right? If it's below 0.3, you're probably not going to get more than two reps on most yep. of your lifts. So if it's getting there and it's getting really bad, it's either you're going to start to adjust first the velocity, then it's position and range of motion. And I'd rather you not adjust your range of motion or position. So right. it's if it's below 0.3 or certain benchmark that we're trying to hit, whether it's absolute strength, strength, speed, speed, strength, or just maximum velocity. Okay, well, we now have some guiding light here. And right. the other part, which is great, if I start to see RSI not going in the right direction, okay, well, I need to do a little bit max velocity or strength speed or stuff that's a little bit quicker and moving faster. Because what is so apparently, and this is, seems dumb to say out loud, is when we stop doing these things that are faster, we stop getting the results that get in terms of higher jumps or better RSIs. It's very logical. And you get so wrapped up in, well, they're just paying me to look better. So we're just going to do a lot of high tension, a lot of slow stuff. And then they don't jump higher and all of a sudden they're not as efficient and they start to plateau. Okay, well, it's a, it just gives you some sort of reason to do dynamic effort and plyometrics or things with higher speeds with general population, which is so easy to say, well, what's the point? Who cares? It's not making them look better. It's only just risk. It's not true. It's definitely not. And I now have evidence to support that. <clears throat> and then just, I mean, this may sound very simple, but tracking progressive overload and tracking all your, yeah. your volume and intensity, like what a, what a novel thought, <laughs> but like yeah. you, you find so yeah. many places just don't do it, especially in like right. group exercise, right? Like they're just hiding behind randomness and novelty. And it's like, when we get members coming from an over gym concept, like, what do you mean? I got to do more than I did last week. I didn't even know what I did last week. Thank God we track it. Cause right. I know what you did last week and what you got to do now is more. And that's the secret yeah. sauce. It's I can now, I don't need to test cause every day is a test. Are you better or worse? Right. Yes or no. And for me, I see that very clearly and I can go to our coaches and I want to tell our coaches three things. One, do we make our athletes better? That's bottom line. Do we make them better than, than someone else or somewhere else? The other part is, are they safe? Are they executing the techniques that we're asking them to do? If they're getting hurt and they're not executing the technique that we're asking them to do, it's pretty simple. Fix your technique or at least have the courage to correct it. And the final one is, do they believe in us? Do they have accountability? I'm like, do they make eye contact when we're talking to them? Do they listen to mm -hmm. our cues? Do they stop and make this association with this person is giving me insight and value? We're not. And if you don't have that impact, if you're not holding them accountable to execution or you're not making them better, you're not a great coach. Right. And that's how we're going to judge and evaluate you. And you want feedback? Here, you got to make them better. You got to get keep them safe. And you got to get them to listen. And if they're not, okay, we're going to give you some sort of training or education to support that, which again, is another level. It goes into front end of the front of the house, working with our athletes and clients and saying, these are all big things that we're trying to track between our force plates and our Nordics and our grip and our velocity. And in the back of the house, it's, Hey, I'm evaluating you start to finish. Did you start on exactly. time? Do they make eye contact when you're breaking down the lift? And this is something that most young coaches don't really get is if you're looking at the board and I'm talking and you're behind me just messing around, not paying attention, you're not making an impact. Exactly. Yeah. And you don't you see that. So you need me back here like, hey, coach, turn around. Yeah. Look at your <laughs> look at your team. Because they're just now so preoccupied with just reading off the board. I'm like, right. I can assure you this person that's making seven figures who's coming here at 530 in the morning to get a great workout can read. I'm yeah. sure they can read. <laughs> they don't need you to read it to them. You need to talk to them. And if you feel like they got a great grasp of it, shut up and get out of the way. Yeah. You now facilitate. Hey, I set up your room. You got this. Go. I'm here to answer any questions or help out or spot whatever you need. Just understand that's your role right now. Yeah. And I tell them all the time. 
if this person's capable of making six or seven figures, they can learn what we could do quicker than we can because they're right. way smarter. Yeah. Doesn't mean You're, that what we yeah. do what we do is not impactful or significant. Yeah. You just need to know where your redeemable value is. And it's more tied yeah. into facilitating and providing a great experience and making it efficient and not getting in their way. Right. And sometimes it's a cue. Sometimes it's like, hey, are, you know, elbows up on your front squat or squeeze them in, like make eye contact straight ahead, like keep the bar tight. Like those small things. But the most part, it's Okay, everybody knows that this person is wildly successful and has got a lot of experience, and you're the thousandth iteration of a coach in front of them. Yeah, that's okay. Make an impact. And, and you know, your best athletes are like that. Like I seldom ever had to go talk to Joe Burrow. Um, mm. You know, seldom, if ever. And the only time it was, I would, I, it was Joe. That's too heavy, Joe. You're going to kill yourself. Which is a great problem uh, to have. Right. Uh, Jamar Chase, Justin Jefferson, the great ones. Uh, Damian Lewis, who played last night, played guard for the Seattle Seahawks. I, you could just look at what Damian was doing and you know, Andrew, I could go on, Kyle Williams, Andrew Whitworth. Those were not the guys that I spent my days talking to. It was the other guys that couldn't process the information that needed me. And, you know, so that's a great point, um, which leads me, the, which led me to this thought that the coach was looking at the board and not looking at the athletes. One thing that I always wanted to do, and I told our young coaches this, if I'm coaching somebody up on his stance or the second pull of the clean or his squat depth, and there's three other guys in the group, go on and gather all four guys up and coach this guy and let the other three listen. Don't just talk to this guy. Make sure everyone in the group hears what you're saying because they're going to be going next. Mm -hmm. And then it also helps them. And then I would turn and say, hey, if you see him doing that again, make sure you correct him because I'm going to be over here. So don't let him do that. And then, you know, everybody gets better then. And that's, yeah. Kind of uh, coaching, it's yeah. Coaching, right? Like yeah. it's just making a impact that grows exponentially right. every single time someone does something thereafter. Yeah. Right. All because you had the awareness to say, "I'm going to say this all four of these guys. I'm going to stop them because it's that important. Because they're yeah. all making the same mistake, or this one person's kind of the bell cow at that rack. I'm going to not prison rules it, but like I'm going to go up to yeah. that person, make sure he's doing it right, and then by default, everyone else is. And exactly. then when it gets into the follow up, is I'm in the back three racks down like finish keep it tight and then, like, <laughs> right like i don't yeah. need to get an elaborate like breakdown of like why right. bar, a bar being tight is so important yeah. you just trigger it right now yeah. they go okay i know like same thing when they're running full speed yeah. right and that would be always like or change the direction like all right yeah. we're gonna do drills we're gonna do a skips b skips all this stuff well if it's not manifesting into when you're running seeing good front side and back side exactly. or if you're doing change of direction or agility drill and they can't absorb that foot into the ground with their shoulder inside that knee what's the point of the drills right. if anything you're using that as a platform to give context of like no elbows in i want you to pull those elbows back and i want you to lift the front side knee just like we did in a skip yeah. just a subtle reminder but i think that's the part too where uh, a lot of young coaches get hung up everyone does it like myself included i'm not like yeah. i'm not i'm sitting here talking like i'm this like uh, elite level coach i'm just like there's they're good and bad days but yeah you get better about understanding the power of timing and the words and the way you phrase it right the elevating mm -hmm. your voice like elbows up like screaming yeah. at a point because you know you see three guys in a row doing it wrong because they just eh, right. whatever it's, it's 40 kilos i'm just gonna snap it up and yeah. down how you do one thing is how you do everything. If you're doing 40 kilos yeah, like that, it's exactly. going to look like that with 160. It's just not going to change. You're not going to rise to the occasion. You're going to fall to your level of preparation. So you got to drive your elbows up. Like 40 kilos matters more than 160 right now. Do it right. All right. That's so do, just get better over time, man. Yeah. When, uh, and hopefully he'll listen to this podcast, uh, but I'm going to give a shout out to double A because, um, uh, I used to make double A. We'd start with the bar and then we'd put 40 kilos on it. And he mm -hmm. was like, why do I have to lift this lightweight? And I said, double A, world champions start with greens. Yeah. Yeah. And that became one of his mantras. And yeah. he, you know, because, great. yeah, <laughs> world champions start with greens and they do. Yeah. 
Um, and so, yeah, so that that's cool. You know, that's the cool thing about doing this podcast because, um, um, now I used to tell people it's like selling insurance. You know, when you first start selling insurance, you sell all your friends, but all of my friends and all of my guests that have been on the podcast so far are in some way connected one way or another. So it's cool that I can sit here and carry on a conversation with you and talk about double a and, and Eric and, and everyone, uh, in between, uh, even Melissa came up and it's great. And that's been the rewarding thing about doing this podcast and having people like you own here because you're passionate. You're just as passionate as Melissa is. Like when I look at your gym, like the, the, the link that you went selecting each piece of equipment that you have, even in your home gym. So you have switched over now to the home gym, but that when you walk into the weight room at North stadium and see Melissa's gym, or if you go to the mic where the softball team trains, and look at their gym or her gym and the softball team's gym there, there's there's a common theme and it's spotless and there's a place for everything. It's neat. It there's there's a reason why we do things. And that's what's so neat about this podcast because you see it time and time and time again, no matter who I have on here. So that's super cool. Yeah. Well, it was me saving up money and busting my ass for you know, 15 years in college strength conditioning, and now it's mine. It's my car. It's my bike. It's yeah. whatever it is when you're a kid that your dad was like, you want it, go get a go get a job or yeah. start doing some chores. And then you save and you save and you save and you get it and take care of that thing because it's yours. Same yeah. thing with the gyms, man. Like That yeah. is the product of getting chewed out and motherfucked and nonstop <laughs> and just being missing so many weddings and funerals and stuff yeah. that I still regret to this day. I'm not losing that, man. If I have yeah. anything I can do. And there was a message when I opened up my first business. And I got it from got some business book. Or maybe it was like NPR, how I built this. The number one 7-Eleven in the world. The only thing they physically said that was only difference is the owner of that 7-Eleven, the one that produces the most revenue annually, just cleans that front door window every hour in the hour. That's the only thing different. Everything is different. Oh, wow. She just gets in their Windex, cleans it every hour in the hour. Everyone is yeah. working, has to clean that front door because that's your first touch point. Yeah. And that makes a huge difference to, oh, well, this place is somewhat clean. And yeah. you think about like, ah, kind of like Target over Walmart, probably because it's yeah. cleaner. And the same thing with your gym, right? If yeah. there's dust everywhere, if there's just crap lying around, if your members can't find anything, if it's like you're sizing them up every single time they walk in, like, oh, you think you're going to come into my gym and outlift me and my kid, my athletes? Like, yeah. Or just, hey, great to meet you. I already know your name. Yeah. Awesome. Like, I want you to have the best possible experience from anything I can control. And if I say you sign up for a class beforehand or if you call them beforehand, I'm going to know your name and I'm going to try to get as much information about you as possible. And then from there, I'm going to make sure that room is clean and organized. So when you walk in there going, how I judge them yeah. is based off the way they do this simple thing of yeah. keeping it presentable. But that's right. it's so easy. And easy. I mean, no one does it. I it's know. like, you know, and it's like, You just think about that from, man, you've been training this as a strength coach for decades. Every one of us, we all do it from an internship all the way through, just busting our ass five in the morning. Like you have an entrepreneurial spirit just from the details in which you have to do your job as a college strength coach. Mm -hmm. And if hopefully anyone's listening to this, they feel empowered of like, you have a lot more control. And I'm not sitting there trying to like shit all over the commercial fitness industry, but as a whole... A lot of it's a bunch of unqualified, untrained people who have no right training someone else. It is the restaurant business of the 90s or bar industry. And I know enough John Tafferty and Bar Rescue to go, there's a bunch of people who should never own a bar. And now there's a bunch of people who should never own a gym. It's unclean. It's unkept. It's a bunch of unregulated, uncared for equipment with a bunch of bad programming and a bunch of bad coaching. Yeah. All you got to do is control the controllables and you can be wildly successful. It's not easy. Still got to bust your ass every single day and deliver on a great product and never have a bad day and never put a customer's experience below your own. But, man, you can do it, man. Like, it is, it's not hard. You've been doing it. You've been dealing with coaches that are just going to chew you out for every possible thing possible. You're dealing with athletes that aren't always intrinsically motivated, and you still deliver. 
you can do it. Every one of us can do it. You just got to have that, like that, that emotional stamina and that perseverance yeah. and that just, you know, the courage, you know? Yeah. Uh, coming out of college, my first job was at American Fitness Sports Center in Nashville. So I graduated on a Saturday and I went to work on a Monday and I, you know, we had a couple things that we talked about all the time, but the number one thing was, is that it was my responsibility. They didn't ask me, they told me to every person. I had to make every person feel special the first time they met me. So every person that walked in that door, the first thing I was supposed to do was make them happy that they had met me that day. And then one of the other things, and you brought this up, is, is about cleanliness. And anyone who's ever worked for me knows how important it was. And this is where I got it, was um, every night when we finished work, uh, we, you know, we had to go through the entire facility and clean it. Now, we had to clean it throughout the day, but at night, before we closed the doors, we cleaned it. Our boss would do a walkthrough that night, and he would take a little piece of paper and every little speck of dust, every smudge, uh, he did it with post it notes. He would mark it. He'd walk through the whole building and mark. And then we would get there first thing in the morning and we would have to go hit all the high spots that we missed. And he was serious about that. And that carried over into the first gym that I had when I became a strength coach. And it's been like that ever since. Uh, and it's important. Um, uh, yeah. It's important because people see that. Um, the people who matter will see that. Yeah. Well, and it goes into this like next level of why it's important to keep good staff, you know, and yeah. you know, you see you see the the development of being in a place for three, four years, and you see the culmination of certain things that you're kind of using as benchmarks, like you know, with you know, Siano, we used to do the four quarter agility drills and can we have less callbacks? And that stuck yeah. with me, right? It was all right, the guys either understand the assignment better or they're just better. And yeah. we had something objective, like they're changing direction better. They're better. They're better conditioned. They understand they can take coaching better. I, we all felt collectively going into preseason, they're going to be more prepared. But the same thing with your staff. Like and when you get new people in, there's growing pains. And they're like, yeah. oh, my God, like I'm having to start from scratch. But you know, as a director and being out as long as you can, those first foundational steps are great. But then when you get to like year two, three, four with a staff member and they get it, you know, they start taking on that responsibility themselves. Like, yeah, you know, coach is going to exactly. be this. We're going to figure this out now. And you don't realize that until they take their head job and they go, hey, like I'm now parlaying that to the next person. You got to start from scratch. But, you know, as a whole, like continuity with your members or your paying customers, continuity with your staff, continuity with being at a place like there's goods and bads. You know, there's yeah. complacency, there's issues of people like, hey, you know, I'm not going anywhere. I haven't gone anywhere yet. So, you know, I'm going to show up to work one minute before work starts and try to leave one minute before work's over, you know, those elements. But as a whole, majority of the good outweighs the bad from those simple things of like, I'm, if I'm a betting man, after three months of seeing 100 post-it notes, after maybe a couple months, there's probably down to under 10, you know, and that's the goal, right? As a manager and a leader, like, well, oh, okay, it looks like they're getting it. They're figuring yeah. out the the feedback was necessary and they've responded ap appropriately. And that's kind of like a really good objective way to say anything. This brings us to the end of today's podcast. I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did. The response to the podcast has been amazing. And I really appreciate everyone that continues to join in with us on every Wednesday. For more information about the Moffitt Method Speed, Strength and Conditioning Program, please visit our website themoffettmethod.fit, or email us at info at themoffettmethod.fit. Thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you again next week for part two of this amazing podcast with Coach Tim Karen.